welcome back. Uh, you caught me in the middle of something. No, not what you think. I'm actually trying to get some microscopic photographs of these tiny little hollow glass spheres. Micro balloons. That's what we're going to talk about today. So stick around. So if this is your first time to the channel, my name's Franco. I'm a professional engineer, a lure designer and lure maker. And I make these videos to help other lure makers by injecting a little bit of physics and engineering into the art of lure making. <clears throat> You're gonna notice my voice is a little off. I actually uh, just got over a cold. So we're gonna be talking about micro balloons. And this substance is exactly what it sounds like. So you can see that these little glass balloons actually look white and almost like half melted snow but if you look closer you can see that they're actually hollow you can see in this image that they have a rim or a shell and I'm not an expert on how uh, these glass spheres are made I know they use chemicals and chemical reactions to cause a froth in uh, molten glass and that causes these little tiny bubbles to uh, sort of form but what's important to us is that these things actually are wonderful to add to resin specifically casting resin and what most of us use is polyurethane casting resin. It cures pretty hard and pretty fast and it captures a lot of detail. So why add micro balloons? Okay, so let me show you what this looks like in the jar. You can see it has the consistency of kind of cornstarch. It's very fine. And even when you rub it between your fingers, it doesn't feel very grainy. And we use this stuff to extend the casting resin to increase the volume without adding any significant weight at all. And what that does is it reduces the density and makes your lure more buoyant, right? But it's not just that it's more buoyant because some of you are thinking, well, I like my lures to sink. Actually, I add more of this stuff on lures that I want to sink or crankbaits that I want to suspend because starting with a lure that wants to float gives the lure maker a lot more control of the behavior of that lure in the water. Let me explain it. Let's assume you've designed a crankbait. And actually this could be any kind of lure. It could be a twitch bait or even a topwater bait. The only thing this doesn't apply to is fast sinking jigging baits. That really you just want to drop to the bottom of the ocean as fast as possible. But anything that you want to control the action on, anything you want to control the behavior as you crank it, any lure like that, you're gonna to need to finesse the weight and balance. So a lure that is sinking is only gonna have the hooks as a sort of anchor or a way for it to fall belly first. But that doesn't guarantee it'll do it. If your lure is big enough and massive enough, it could override the weight of the hooks and even the hooks drag could override it and your lure could fall kind of sideways. Plus, when you crank it, all bets are off on how that lure is actually gonna behave. So what you want is a little bit of a war between the buoyant force and gravity. Since most of these resins aren't very buoyant, you wanna add buoyancy. Those micro balloons will tend to settle or float up to the top of the pour. So if your pouring sprue is right here, you pour your resin in, the micro balloons are gonna be more concentrated near the top, giving the lure more buoyancy near the top, and then typically will add weight near the bottom, right? And that gives you that tension between the pull of gravity and the pull of buoyancy. That keeps that lure standing up. It also keeps it much more predictable in action. The other benefit of adding the uh, micro balloons is that it really makes your lure easier to sand. So if you need to do any post cast sanding, uh, this is gonna help you out quite a bit. Um, I also get questions about silica, fumed or colloidal silica, and it's not the same thing. It looks a little alike. The fumed silica can be a little yellower than this, and it's also a little more dangerous to sort of handle. You don't want to breathe fume silica. And colloidal silica isn't great for you either. It can really irritate your, your lungs and your eyes. This is glass and glass is pretty much non-reactive even inside your body. So it's not a good idea to, to breathe it. So if you're gonna be handling it and sanding around it, wear a dust mask. Some protective eye gear isn't a bad idea. And probably gloves, although I, I tend to ignore my own advice on that. So now you know what it is and what it's used for. Now, the bigger question I have most often is how much do I put in there? And I can always say it depends on the lure, but 
really, as a lure maker, I can tell you it's always best to stick to one formula. And I only have two formulas. And that's because I did a lot of experimentation and I found two formulas that work really well for me. Now, the other benefit to using this stuff, the more you use, the less resin you use because this takes up all that volume. And typically, per volume, this stuff's a little more expensive. So deciding on how much to use, it's really gonna be kinda up to you. But my advice is to come up with one formula you like. And what I did was to make these pucks. And these are just quick samples that I made out of the latest resin that I buy. And then I do a 10% and 8% and sometimes I'll do a 5% mix of resin to micro balloons. And that's by weight, not by volume. I think adding by volume is only good if you're mixing it for say a big resin and fiberglass job or something you're doing on a boat. Otherwise, you're making small parts like this. You really need to consider doing it uh, by weight. Let me show you what one of these things looks like. And if you take a look really close, you can see these were made in a little graduated plastic cup, a little measuring cup, and you can still see the, the graduations on it. And that makes it a lot simpler to do this. So I'll mix my mixture, pour it in the cup, let it set, and then I can read directly what the volume is. I can weigh it. And then by doing uh, some quick math, I can calculate what the density of this stuff is. And this one came out to be 0.57 something. Yeah, 0.576 grams per milliliter. And that is super handy. That's my 10% mix. Let's go to the board and I'll explain what that means. All right, what I mean by that is that if I use six grams of A, six grams of B, the total is 12 grams. And so 10% of that would be 1.2 grams. And that's the weight of micro balloons that I would add to this mix. That would be my 10% mix. The only other mix I use is an 8% mix. And with the same amount of resin being mixed, the amount of micro balloons would go down to 0.96 grams. And so what's really a little bit counterintuitive is that I use the 8% mix, which would result in a less buoyant mix. I use that for top water lures and not for lures that sink more. Because on a top water lure, all I want is a guarantee that it'll float. I don't need a whole lot of that interactive sort of tug of war underwater. I just need that thing to float. And now I'll show you how to figure out how much resin to use for each one of your lures. All right, I've just filled this with water. This is just a little volume displacement little tank. And all it is is a piece of PVC sealed on one end with a tube near the top. And I just filled it so it would overflow from the tube and now it's stable, right? No more is coming out. So anything I put in there, it will displace the volume of water that it has itself. So I'm gonna take my original master for my little pan belly twitch bait. You can see it's not meant to be a real lure. And I'm gonna stick it in this water and displace the volume. And then by capturing that water, I'll know what the volume of this lure is. So let's just lower it down there with this thin piece of wire. And you can see it immediately starts to displace water. And I just take it under there until it's just under water. And when the drops stop, that's the volume. You can just weigh this water, and since water is one gram per milliliter, you'll know exactly, directly, what, how much volume there is. But since we plan to do it by volume directly, let's go ahead and do it. I'm pouring it into this little cup, and then I'll just read it directly, and I'm not sure you'll be able to see it, but it says approximately 17 milliliters. So what I do with that information now is I divide that by two, right? So part A would be eight and a half grams, part B would be eight and a half grams. My 10% mix, I would have 1.7 grams of micro balloons. So let's go ahead and do it. So the best way I've found to mix this stuff, the most efficient way is what I call the one cup method. And I use, use one small little bathroom Dixie cup. I'll put it on my scale and turn on the scale. And this way the scale will be teared or zeroed with the cup on it. Now I'll put in my eight and a half grams. So it's 8.53, that, or 5.2, whatever it is. If you're within a few hundreds of a gram, you're plenty good. So now I'll tear it or zero it again, and I'll add my 1.7 grams of micro balloons. 
and this is going to look like a lot. And you can actually pull a little off the top if you need to. 1.69, that's good enough. Now you, make, you take a mixing stick and you get this thoroughly blended in before you mix in part B. And this gives you plenty of time at this stage. It's kind of a creamy consistency. It doesn't take much to get it nicely blended. Now I've got my weighted harness in the mold. I just need to put it together and put it in my mold holder and then we'll pour this guy. All right, I got my mold ready to go in the holder. Now I just need to add part B. And again, it's 8.5 grams of part B. I'll zero the cup out again and just add my 8.5 grams. All right, 8.54, that's good. And then we mix. Now, if you've done this before, if you've made these kind of uh, pours before, you know that this stuff expands. And that's a good thing. And you don't want to pour so little that it actually expands up to fill uh, the actual mold. You want to fill the mold and let it expand out to kind of a mushroom on top. The reason you want that is when, when it expands from a partially filled mold up, it'll tend to trap bubbles a lot more. So I like to, to add just a little extra. And this usually does the trick, especially if you're not uh, working in a really cool room. You know it's kicking off when that uh, resin starts to warm up in your hands. There you go. And I've got a little bit, very tiny bit in the bottom and that's just fine. And if you tend to be a little fussy about waste like I am, you can always drop this down a half a gram per side. So instead of eight and a half, I would probably go eight next time. In fact, that's probably what's in my notes to make this lure. All right, so I brought my uh, little test tank over here because I just wanted to show you something. This lure, which is my fat belly, the one we just cast, uh, is designed to float, just slightly head down, when I don't have hooks on it. So let's put some hooks on it and I'll show you. Just gonna hang them on here. With the hooks on, it's designed to sink nice and slowly. One hook fell off, so it's gonna rise slowly. So having your lure buoyant gives you the opportunity or the ability to actually get that kind of refined sinking and floating behavior that you're gonna want on any subsurface lure. So let's go ahead and demold this one. All right, that looks pretty good. And let me just clean off the flash and I'll cut off the uh, sprue mushroom. Do a little more cleaning. So that's what it looks like. Let's put it in the tank. And it should float. And then it should sink slowly with the hooks on it. So you can see, you can really get a lot of control. And in fact, you saw this one sank a lot faster. And that's because I designed this one to sink a little faster. I have fabrication notes on all my lures. Uh, and I usually have waiting for fast sinking, slow sinking, suspending, and floating. So obviously, this was a fast sinking or maybe even medium sinking. All right, I hope I covered everything you guys were interested in. I hope I covered all the questions I've been asked. But as always, if you have questions, certainly leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. I wanna say thank you to everyone who's been commenting and certainly everyone who has subscribed. And if you haven't, certainly subscribe. It really helps the channel out. And just as a note, I'm trying to keep a little bit of a conversation going uh, on the community tab on the channel. If you go to the channel and you look across the top bar where it says videos, about the channel, all those different tabs. There's a tab there called community. If you go in there and it's like a little forum posting board and I usually post something there just to give you a heads up of where I am and what I'm doing. And I did put a posting on there and asking anyone who has been uh, inspired to make a lure uh, either directly like mine or at least you used a technique that maybe you learned or you just got inspiration to go out there and try one. I'm asking if you'll just share photographs of your lures. They don't have to be great. Everybody who's ever made a lure has made, uh, you know, rough looking ones early on. So 
So don't worry about it. Just send me some photos and I'm going to make a collection of them. And at the end of the year, I want to do a slideshow of uh, subscribers lure work. And if you've got a picture with your lure in the mouth of a fish, that's extra bonus points. All right, we're getting close to the 20,000 subscriber goal for the end of the year, and I'll probably do some kind of giveaway. So if you guys got any ideas, share them in the comments, and I'll see you guys next Friday.